Hello guys, uh, welcome to my live stream and sorry for the delay, as usual, some technical issues. Plus, I got some ideas while I was chatting just before the start of this, um, of this uh, live stream. Uh, so, well, it's the first live stream again after my long, long trip in Bretagne, family road trip, which was absolutely great. Uh, we spend a whole month away on the road, plus in the last 10 days uh, I played in the French League, I was together with my family as well, and we, we the team played really well, and I, I did play well too, so I'm, I'm very happy about everything. Um, we didn't really have good internet connection from there, I, as you may have seen, I um, managed Thanks to Marie, managed to post, a, post a, a video about the trip at some point, but the, the connections, internet connections in the several places we were staying at well, they were not really good, uh, if existent at all. So I couldn't really do either, neither live streams nor uh, more than that, unfortunately. But um, here I am back home and uh, tonight we're going to do several things, actually. So I'm going to welcome all of you, Anit Chess, of course, with whom I chatted before already. And uh, we're going to do some chess as well towards the end, probably watch some uh, Grand Chess Tour uh, games from Leuven from yesterday and before yesterday. Today I didn't really, well, I checked the results, but I couldn't really work things out. Next week, I'm not going to be able to do a live stream because, because I'm going to do the commentary, the live commentary of the Grand Chess Tour from Paris, from the Canal Plus studio. As you may know, already for the third year in a row, uh, the Paris Grand Chess Tour is being co-organized by um, Canal Plus, Vivendi, the Vivendi group, and they provide live commentary um, on TV, on the Canal Plus Sport French TV channel. And I'm, I'm gonna be one of the commentators as well. Uh, for the third year in a row and really it's gonna be something uh, really cool um, so yeah next week I'm not gonna be there but in two weeks again uh, but for tonight uh, for tonight and that's also why I am a bit late is because I wanted to set up something special uh, which actually popped up in my mind um, when I was uh, chatting before the start and I thought it could be an interesting idea to actually not just chat, not just keep an eye on the chat and then answer my, your questions there, but also uh, chat with some of you, the ones who wish uh, actually to chat uh, by voice, by voicemail. So actually, uh, if you want to ask me some questions or I'm just gonna ask you a few things also about you, what you've been doing in this month and so on, uh, we can connect on Messenger, um, Facebook Messenger, uh, so just send me uh, a message. Um, yeah, you can find me easily if, if we are not friends yet on Facebook. Uh, you can find me easily, Peltier Yannick, and you're gonna uh, send me. Uh, you can send me a friend request or just a um, a message a message there, and we we can talk actually about uh, what we've been doing. If you have any small questions, and I I'm, I will gladly answer your questions. Uh, by voice, so I'm gonna hear you and you are gonna hear me as well. So, uh, well, I can see that some people are here connected. Uh, hi, um, okay, I need chess, of course. Uh, we've been say, exchanging some messages before. Uh, Ian, Ian Lam as well, hello. Nice to see you again. And uh, so, um, yeah, I keep an eye on my messenger on Facebook and uh, so don't hesitate. Uh, to uh, send me a message if you uh, want to talk a bit about uh, things you've been doing about chess. After that, uh, we're also going to talk a bit about the Grand Chess Tour. What do you think about this, mm, this great competition? Uh, there might be shortcomings you, you, you find there. Are, um, hello, Noah, as well. Uh, and um, yeah, the Grand Chess Tour is actually for the third or fourth maybe even fourth year now on the tour and uh, it's uh, it's pretty interesting uh, what's been going on but um yeah let's talk about this as well here um so let me see my in my messenger if i have already some mes messages or something so because i i see your um your uh, handle here on youtube but i i might not 
uh, know you or know if you we are friends on Facebook. Uh, Yan Lam, thank you for <laughs> buying one of my DVDs. Uh, so that must have been the hedgehog and now the French is on order. Well, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that. I hope you enjoyed uh, the hedgehog already, even though you might not have uh, listened and studied all of the material there because it's pretty extensive. And uh, yeah, the French, the hedgehog is actually a whole repertoire for chess players of all levels, but that's going from strong to, um, to, um, to a beginning, yeah, from club beginning players in, in, uh, uh, in, um, in the hedgehog or in chess. Uh, the French is rather uh, a, a repertoire of explanations for starting out in the French defense. So uh, you can actually get the DVD and learn the French defense from scratch. Just, um, uh, okay, thank you, Yan Lam. Very instructive, I'm very happy to hear that. So, um, well, actually that's uh, an idea I got uh, about this uh, talking with my, um, with you, my, my audience uh, on, on, on YouTube, and that, that's actually something I, I, I think is a good idea, not just to chat, but also sometimes to talk uh, by voice, because chatting, you know, it's not always, I mean, it's much more efficient if we do it uh, by, uh, by voice, by talking. So I am on, on Messenger, and um, yeah, maybe another time we can do it on Skype, as Marie said, um, indeed. And uh, okay, I'll, I'll be waiting uh, for the moment. Um, before some of you contact with me, uh, let me ask you what you think about the Grand Chess Tour, uh, which has been going on now for four years, and uh, the format has been changing a little bit, but um, I think um, it's, um, yeah, now it's been established with a, a few rapid and blitz events, a few classical tournaments and um, yeah I'd, I'd actually be glad to to hear your opinion mm -hmm. so let me see um here i am on facebook i can see anyone yet right to me so anyway Yeah, Wesley so Wesley so is on fire. Caruana is not doing too well so far. And there is actually a big name missing in that uh, in that Grand Chess Tour. Of course, that's uh, Magnus Carlsen, the world champion. And actually it happened as well two years ago when he was, f well, he would actually be focusing on the world championship match two years ago against Karyakin, this year against Caruana. So um, it's, um, yeah, it's his decision. I think it's quite a wise decision because when you agree to, to enter the Grand Chess Tour, you commit yourself to playing in four or five events. And um, I think Magnus Carlsen didn't really want this mm -hmm. before the World Championship match uh, in November against Caruana. I don't mind because uh, that also means that he's available and free to play in Beal this summer. Uh, so uh, in actually from my side, it's actually very good because otherwise I believe if he had um, agreed to play in the Grand Chess Tour um, with uh, St. Louis being held quite close to Beal in August, I think he would not have been able to participate in Beal. Um, yeah, Noah Fekker. Noah, you're absolutely right. I think Caruana has to try and force a decision in the classical games against uh, Magnus Carlsen because in rapid and even more in blitz, he's usually um, inferior to Carlsen and actually inferior to his peers in, uh, at the top of the world. Except in those days with, when he's really on top, really in great shape, then he can play uh, chess quite good but uh, uh, Blitz is quite good, but it's, it's actually quite rarely the case. So uh, definitely he should not uh, do this against uh, Carlsen. He might not have a choice. He might be knocked out before that as well. But um, if he has a chance against Carlsen, if he stands a chance against Carlsen in November, that is certainly in classical chess. 
especially as Magnus Carlsen is extremely strong in, uh, you know, in the money time when when one game counts for everything or one day or just a few games. It's not like, you know, you have this whole match of 12 games and game four, five, six, you know, does not yet decide on everything. But game 11, 12, and of course, possible play of games, rapid games or blitz games even, uh, they will decide on everything. And uh, we could see it against Karyakin. He was, uh, e even though Karyakin is himself a very strong rapid and blitz player, I mean, Karyakin had no chance in that playoff in New York. So, uh, well, let me just check the messenger if anyone is there. So I need chess. If you, if you want to talk a bit about your Neidorf um, study in last month and also about your uh, coming to Beale this summer, which I'm certainly looking forward to, uh, please uh, do not hesitate and we can uh, have a quick chat here on messenger if you want uh, by voice. Uh, otherwise, I suggest that we, um, yeah, we organize something uh, in Beal because Noah will be playing in Beal, and you will be as well, and certainly other players who, who uh, or other people who uh, follow the live streams, some Swiss players as well. So we can uh, we can actually decide on 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 doing something one evening, um, you know, perhaps going out for a drink or for for a meal or perhaps meet in the congress hall and, and do. Uh, look a bit at chess as well. Um, that's all the plans which uh, we can uh, easily um, discuss uh, beforehand or, or even spontaneously in Beal. Because Beal is actually in a bit, a bit more in than a month. It's starting on 21st of July, so in a, in a month and a week actually. So, um, so yeah, that would be good. So, um, yeah, I was talking about the Grand Chess Tour and um, nobody has mentioned that yet, but I've read, be it on Facebook or on Twitter or somewhere, that some people s tend to get a little bit uh, bored by the fact that top players continuously play each other. Um, well, we don't have Magnus, that's what we said, and hello, Nicolas. Uh, nice to see you as well uh, after this whole month of uh, break. Uh, so, um, so I'd like to actually hear your opinion about about this thing. It's not just a grand chess tour uh, thing. It's uh, Norway chess inviting the top ten basically, except Kramnik this year who did not accept to play. Um, there is this, yeah, Norway chess. There is, you know, so many so many tournaments which or whose main aim is to reach the highest possible rating average. So you invite, if possible, the top 10 in the world or uh, the first or maybe eight people from the top 10 plus two, which who are very close to it. And, and it's true that sometimes, especially in classical chess, when players may be more careful maybe or, or will actually tend to neutralize each other, and we had this, this effect this year, I think it was in the Gashimov Memorial in Shamkir in Azerbaijan in April or May, I think, when uh, the first three or four rounds ended, all the games ended in a draw. Uh, and that was actually um, yeah, not not desired result, even though players fought out their games. But I don't know what you think about the Grand Chess Tour, because in, in this case, we have we're doing we're dealing with rapid games and um, not just rapid games but um, but also um, blitz games so three ga three days of, of rapid chess and then two days of blitz chess and this definitely in my opinion at least tends to heat up matters uh, well we could see it in Leuven but in the other uh, rapid tournaments and blitz tournaments of the previous Grand Chess Tours to editions. Um, there was a lot of action and um, well players uh, do uh, contribute to this uh, heat in the tournament uh, to these many uh, decisive results and in my opinion actually the format of having rapid and blitz is very attractive it doesn't prevent draws or whatever but basically will We'll, we'll see a lot of action. And we have more games as well, three rounds per day, or in 
this case, in the case of the Blitz, it's nine games, nine rounds per day. So it's a lot of chess uh, and a lot of, uh, actually, of action. And uh, in, in classical chess, you might get kind of, and you know, entangled in some drawing uh, sequences when uh, you see that other people basically uh, also draw their games. So you, you, you know, you don't really want to take too much risks because if you fall down minus one, then you're suddenly on last place in the tournament. That's certainly not something you want to you experience. Um, so I'm, I'm checking your uh, comments here also on the chat. Meanwhile, um, in Shamkir there were many uh, very players who constantly make draw against. Yeah, you're right, Noah. Um, there was Mamedyarov, Rajabov, and I think Mamedov as well. Or previous in previous years, perhaps uh, even more than three. Uh, and it's true that, uh, well, I'm not going to say they prearranged their games, but at least they made all draws and sometimes it's not very nice. And actually in the Norway chess, okay, the Norway chess was very unlucky this year, of course. First of all, Mamed Yarov came with big tooth ache and uh, he, he didn't really feel well. He, he didn't know if he uh, should cancel his participation or not. And then after a few days, Ding Liren, who we all know about, we've all heard about this thing where he fell from his bike uh, from yeah and and he uh, broke his hip and uh, he had to stop uh, so he, he, they were unlucky indeed but uh, but then you had this this um, controversy started by Magnus Carlsen I think at a um, press conference maybe when he uh, mentioned that uh, even at the top some players do prearrange draws and um, well actually he, it's um, you know, it's it's not a, a it's not big news. Not many people talk about this, but it's true that sometimes some players do prearrange their games. Uh, there have been rumors that uh, for a while Kramnik and Anand did make draws, uh, prearranged draws in, uh, at the top tournaments uh, for whatever reasons. I I don't know why, but it's uh, it's um, yeah, it's rumors which are more or less confirmed. And it seems that Mamed Yarov and Karyakin, as, as Carlsen said in his press conference, uh, that they sometimes pre-arrange draws as well. Uh, so it's, um, yeah, it's not, not very nice, actually. But what can you do? Um, Nicholas, I really enjoy watching Rapid. I think it's a good balance speed-wise. Not too fast, but not too slow. Well, it's true that actually Rapid Chess is my favorite time control. Oh, my favorite and perhaps the, fa the time control where I am more, uh, let's say, efficient. I'm more efficient than in classical chess. I'm, I'm much more efficient than Blitz, blitz chess. I, I'm really bad at Blitz. But in Rapid, I, I'm pretty good. Uh, and actually, well, for whatever it, it, it means, uh, my highest rating is in the, in the Rapid. I mean, my feeder rating in Rapid is 2640 something, uh, almost 100 points more than classical. Although, of course, many more games are rated in, in classical chess than in Rapid. Um, it's, and in, yeah, in the Blitz, it's, yeah, I, w I don't think I will even be rated. <laughs> Luckily, I'm not rated, but because I have not played any rated Blitz tournament. Um, yeah, some games are sometimes, yeah, it's true that in the last round, as, as Noah says, uh, in the last round of Norway chess, uh, Carlsen uh, made a very quick draw against uh, Maxim Vashilagrav. He was black, so, you know, when you're black, you can't really force matters. And I don't think they prearranged uh, their, their, their game. Uh, that would not really be in the style of either Maxim or no Magnus, so I don't think so. Um, but of course they made a quick draw and that was not so not so nice i well again i'm, I'm gonna make some publicity for for the bill chess festival where i'm part of the organizing uh, organizing committee but in bill we have some some things which um you know some tools let's say let's say which um guarantee more or less a fight in uh, in most games uh, well first of all we have this rule of uh, you know, which forbids draw offers before move 40, which is something, of course, which doesn't fight in any way against prearranged draws, because if you want to prearrange a draw, you can you can have whatever rules you want. It's very difficult to, to prevent that. Uh, but um, 
but uh, what um, what we do as well is choose the field carefully and uh, in previous years I when I was in charge of as, as a tournament director of the Grandmaster Tournament. I, I, you know, uh, rating average was not would not be uh, the priority. Not just because we didn't have the financial means to to ensure the highest possible category, of course, but also because um, we care more about uh, reputation of of players. I mean, I, I prefer to have a, a twenty six ninety. Like f for instance, last year we had Peter Leko in in deal whose rating has fallen down even under 2700. But Peter Leko is a name f for himself. He's been vice world champion in 2004, actually very close to beating Va Vladimir Kramnik in the final. Uh, he's been top three, four in the world for a whole d decade or even more. So he has a name for himself. It's not like, you know, I don't really care about his 2690 or something. It's Peter Leko. And... Um, and actually, you know, he he actually suffers nowadays from his reputation, from a reputation as an extremely solid player, drawing many games. But in deal, he was actually, he had a very normal result of five decisive games, three, uh, I think, three wins and two losses and, uh, and four draws. So actually a very, very combative player, a very fighting player. So the 40 move rule, I think, is a very good rule. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a good mix because forbidding draw offers and, you know, until you have bare kings on the, on the board is a bit too much. Uh, 30 moves is not natural, in my opinion, because 30 moves is not the time control. Time control is 40 moves. So I think it's good to forbid uh, draw offers until move 40. And then, uh, yeah, and then players can do what they want. I mean... Uh, if the position is a draw, then they will make a draw. If one of them is better, then he's not going to agree to a draw and move 41, but he's going to play it on. Um, then, um, yeah, then choosing the, the, the field carefully. I mean, you can have a few solid players in the tournament. That's not a problem as long as you have a mixed field. I mean, mixed in the term, in, in the sense of playing styles. Uh, if you have a Morozovic, uh, you can be sure that there will be uh, a fight. Well, actually, I remember when, when Morozovic and Shirov played uh, in the same Peel Grandmaster Tournament, 2011, probably, I played as well. And strangely enough, these two players with highly entertaining style, when they faced each other, strangely enough, they neutralized the, each other. And the game were not, both games were not extremely interesting. I think they both ended in a draw. So you see, it's better to have... A, a fighting player and a solid player, then you, you are sure you're gonna get a fight. If you have two solid players, well, the fight is usually not on, on the menu that day. And if you have two fighting combative players, then it's not always guaranteed that they will have a fight. Well, this year we, we are pretty lucky because our sponsors have been uh, quite generous and um, we've been able to invite Magnus Carlsen. So with Magnus Carlsen, there's going to be a fight in almost every game. There's Maxim Vashilagrav, who is the record holder of uh, victories in Biel. Uh, there is Mamedyarov, who usually is a very, very aggressive and active player, even though this last year or two, he's been much more solid. So uh, I hope he's going to be... Uh, I, I hope he's going to be true to his uh, former style of former self. Uh, we have Peter Swidler, who tends to be solid, uh, but uh, you shouldn't tickle him too much because he can uh, he can show his uh, teeth. I mean, he's been eight times uh, Russian champion, so that speaks for himself. And two more players, yeah, uh, David Navarra, who who is a fighter, uh, not just a gentleman on and off the board, but also a great fighter. And um, and Nico Georgiadis, that's the Swiss uh, representative. He's uh, a young GM of 21 years old, about 200 points lower lower than the number five Navarra and 300 points lower than than uh, than uh, the world champion. But you know he he can be solid. He knows his stuff. Uh, he's played really well last year in Bio, scoring plus one. And um, you know I'm sure he's not gonna leave the tournament empty-handed. He's gonna score some draws for sure, and perhaps he's up for a surprise. So we'll see. But uh, yeah, I've been digressing a little bit, and um, and uh, actually, let me just see. 
uh, if anyone tried to reach me on Messenger, but that does not seem to be the case. So um, he, um, yeah, he, um, yeah, he's, mm, so Anich says, hey, Nico, is really lucky to play these great players? Of course, yeah. He's gonna have a really tough time, especially since he's gonna play the Swiss Championship just before, which ends barely, yeah, like two days before the start of Rio. So he's gonna have a tough time. Uh, he's just he's just a student, he's not a professional, so I think he was right to accept to play first the Swiss Championship, then Biel. I mean, the Swiss Championship will certainly allow him to heat up before that. Um, so, um, Nicolas, uh, you're asking when I will commentate. Uh, well, I mentioned it just before, M maybe you hadn't yet connected to the uh, live stream, but next, next week there is not going to be a live stream because I'm going to be in Paris for the Grand Chess Tour and that's when I'm going to commentate uh, together with a um, sports journalist uh, from Canal Plus and Almira Skrychenko and Jean-Baptiste Mulon, the same team as in the last uh, two years, I mean the pre two previous years. And that's going to be uh, transmitted live on um, on Canal Plus TV, the French uh, channel, and also on the internet. I am going to keep you updated on my Facebook channel about the links. Don't worry. Um, what you're using on Messenger video chat? Are you using there? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for people to connect. Uh, I don't know if you, Jan, uh, want to connect on Messenger with me. I, uh, yeah, just don't hesitate to send me a message and then we can chat now if you want. And um, yeah, you're gonna tell me what you've been doing in the last uh, few um, weeks or so because I haven't been there. So I, I'm trying to keep up with my um, audience with you guys. Um, so just reading your former message, but when you have younger children, less sleep, so how to keep present in classical chess? Uh, yeah, oh, you're talking about me. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, 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 sure. Uh, yeah, not so easy. Yeah, my, my, I've been training much less, of course. So, um, yeah, sometimes I'm playing much less, so it's not sometimes so, so, so easy. And I'm getting older as well, so many, many factors why I've uh, lost the uh, rating a bit, a bit, yeah. Um, you don't have Messenger and Facebook. Well, we can try. Uh, we can try on Skype. I'm going to check if my phone works on Skype. Let me see. If you have Skype, we can try that there. Mm -hmm. If you want, we can talk on Skype as well. I'm just going to check if, if it's working here. see if it works hmm. it doesn't seem to hmm. doesn't seem my, my Skype seems to have some problems so um, so I uh, have to do with messenger but don't worry otherwise we'll uh, we'll make an appointment for uh, for the live stream in two weeks and I promise everything will be set up because that's an idea which popped up in my mind just before here. Uh, and also Mari suggested that it would be a, a really good idea to have to chat with you guys on, on, uh, on uh, Messenger or Skype. But uh, I didn't really have the time to set up everything. That's why uh, I started late and that's why I have some, some technical issues here as well. So I'm gonna make sure everything works. Uh, next time in two weeks we uh, promise we're gonna do this and uh, you're gonna be ready as well so you're gonna be able to tell me things um, if if you want so uh, maybe we could um, yeah maybe next time talk by Skype that would be good and messenger as well 
so let's check perhaps some chess as well, uh, because uh, there have been some action in, in Leuven uh, in the last two um, days, and well, two days, three days actually. So um, yeah, here we are. I, I've selected a few games, a few moments in those games, which are, which um, ra caused some, well, actually raised my attention. And um, from round one, uh, two days ago, there was this game Anand against Mamedyarov. Anand didn't, wasn't doing well in these last days. Mamedyarov, not great either, even though, um, yeah, you know, when you have um, toothache, it's much more difficult to bite as Mamedyarov can do. Um, so that game, I'm not going to look at, at, yeah, you know, very quickly at the first moves, but then uh, Mamedyarov's attack, the way he started his attack or launched his attack was actually very um, amazing, I thought, because I was, when I watched the game, I, I, I like almost fell off my chair when I saw his move. So here, well, it's a tense position, uh, actually, because, um, well, we have equal material, but uh, the pawn structure is, is weird with double pawns and black has two bishops, he's better developed, there is a strange knight on a4, but um, yeah, there's this move d4, a very strong move, uh, bishop d2, and knight b8, and he actually manages to uh, activate his bishop on a long diagonal, but now he also has a knight on b8, which is a little bit strange. And, um, well, queen b3 was played, so um, black's king is perhaps a bit exposed, but with the bishop on c6, we can also say that white's king is not very safe. So queen takes c5, knight d4. And in this position, when I was checking the game, I thought, okay, white could actually be doing pretty well. And, um, and Mamedyarov found that move here, bishop takes g2. That's an amazing... Uh, yeah, actually in chess, bishop takes g2, you've mentioned it in the chat, really uh, amazing move because, well, I mean, it's, it, it may come as a candidate move when you look at the position, but how to be sure that it works well, especially in a rapid game, it's not that easy. And when I checked that game with the computer, it actually says that bishop takes g2 is the only move for black, uh, not just to be better, but also not to be worse strangely enough, because otherwise white will be able to consolidate uh, with one or two moves. And um, but this bishop takes g2 is actually really, really strong. Um, well, you have to take it, queen g5 check. And the funny thing is black has a, well, let's call it passive knight on b8. He has, okay, this queen is active on g5, the rook is active on f8, that one is developed but not participate, does not participate yet in the attack. So you basically just have a queen on g5 and a rook on f8 uh, as, as attacking tools. And a bear, not really bear, but naked um, white king uh, who's lost his um, main defender, the pawn on g2. And, and nevertheless, black's attack is, is very strong here. Well, if he plays king h1, it's almost curtains. I mean, it's rook takes f2, threatening mate on g2, rook g1 and queen h4. And you can't prevent mate. Uh, well, you can, but uh, in the long run, it's going to be lost. So um, king f1, the only move, queen h4, threatening mate. And now the pawn is, it's not just threatening mate, but the pawn on h2 is hanging as well. And um, if, uh, if he pr protects with queen b2 or rook e2, um, then the, the pawn on h2, let's say queen e2, rook e2, the, the pawn on h2 is falling, threatening mate here on h1, and, and black is, is kind of winning here, strangely enough. I mean, then... So, I mean, even if you see the, the sacrifice on g2, it's not so easy to, you know, to understand that black is going to be winning afterwards, or, or at least much better. But things happened, some things happened in, in the game, and Mamedyarov did not play uh, perfectly afterwards. f3 was played, queen takes h2, rook a e1, very sensible defense by Anand. Knight c6, that's a very strong move, because the knight on b8, I mentioned it before, 
uh, was out, out of play and this knight on d4 centralized protects f3 so it's uh, very normal to try and eliminate the knight here so rook 1 e3 protecting f3 and here Mamedyarov did not follow up in the best possible way he um well he played rook f4 perhaps with the idea to uh, double rooks here before exchanging knights and hitting on a free um, probably that's why that was his idea but he had a much stronger move but not an easy one to spot i mean g5 again i mean enters your scope of uh, candidates move but uh, to understand that this is very strong is not easy but g4 is actually a very nasty threat not just to take here on f3 but also to push the pawn on to g3 and g2 so it makes sense to prevent that with rook 6 to e4 and then comes e5 and that's when uh, you force uh, the knight d4 to disappear and if he takes on c6 then rook d2 decides the game well within just a few moves actually black is, is mating here so um but he played rook f4 and then it allowed uh, anand to uh, come back into the game with rook takes c6 a good defense queen h1 the king runs out b takes c6 and queen e6 and suddenly the black king is a little bit uh, not in danger but um, white gets hope of delivering perhaps perpetual check so he took on f3 and here he could have given a check on e5 that's a line indicated by the computer king g8 queen e6 check rook f7 and the strong move knight d5 and you want to go to e5 so here mm, queen d5 seems to be good takes takes and after knight e5 the computer says that uh, white is more or less okay um the human heart the human eye um, i mean definitely would say that black is the only one capable of fighting for an advantage here so i i would say for instance after oops sorry after rook f1 sorry i'm bringing the game yeah position again after rook f1 i would say only black can be better he's three pawns for uh, and rook for two two knights so that's a lot and uh, even though the knights occupy very nice squares and white seems to be well coordinated i i think that in the long run black is the one with the better chances here clearly well vichy and took on e7 which is all right queen rook takes e3 queen takes queen takes a2 queen e5 check king g8 and here and then missed a very nice move knight d7 which would have um, more or less forced a draw according to the computer it's a nice move because the knight wants to go to f6 that's a very nasty idea and of course if you take on d7 there is queen e8 check winning the rook on the next move and here even white would be better instead of this he played knight c4 and here okay probably in time trouble both players didn't play accurately and that can be easily pardoned queen f2 would have been better than queen d1 check well here king e2 would be better than what he played in the game king d2 that's not very easy to understand at first they repeated moves and here Mamedyarov found the best move queen f5 and that's very good bringing back the queen into uh, black's camp to protect the king a little bit and uh, prevent threats and here black suddenly is better and uh, and in the end well i'm not going to play through uh, until the end but black won the game um well, and, and next, the next game which uh, you know drew my attention was that game with between Aronian and Nakamura, uh, and the interesting moment in the game arose after the opening, which w an opening which actually went really well for Black, uh, because here Nakamura played rook takes a4. It seems he's overlooked queen b5, hitting both the knight and the rook, but Nakamura had an idea in mind that's queen uh, that's rook c4 hitting the bishop rook a c1 and here i think he um, perhaps got overconfident because it 
can hardly be that he missed the following sacrifice by uh, Aronian when he played bishop f6 here. Well, queen a1, queen a8, simply, simply, I mean, it's not, not never so, so easy, but I think would have been better. Um, so I, I can see there is some problems, but I hope I am connected. Uh, let me, let me know in the chat if everything is okay. So anyway, queen a8 would have been better securing the knight, activating the queen. All black's pieces do well, they're well coordinated. What isn't doing too badly, but I think uh, black is already uh, doing really well here. Perhaps even slightly better. Aronian played bishop f6, which the computer thinks is, is fine, but uh, again, the, that's the difference when human eye um, starts being, uh, you know, starts uh, cooperating uh, or interfering even with a computer, then we understand that these kind of moves are strong. Queen takes c6, c takes d4, and now, of course, not moving the queen because otherwise there would be g takes c3 and black is almost winning here. But Aronian sacrificed the queen with bishop takes d4, which is very natural when, when you look at it. I mean, especially for a grandmaster, he's going to spot that in a second. That, that's why I think, uh, you know, Nakamura was perhaps a little bit um, superficial when he went for that continuation, because it's clear that here, white has a rook and a piece, a knight, for, uh, for the queen, but he has nice positional compensation. Uh, he has a very beautiful square on d4 in front of the isolated pawn on d5. He can hit b6. Um, a2 is, let's say, a2 is less vulnerable than b6. And in those pawn structure, when um, black cannot really break through, uh, he doesn't really have any dangerous pawn thrust, uh, white has control over the board. Um, I would say that the evaluation is objectively, um, that the position is balanced, but in practice, this is definitely easier to play for white, especially in a rapid game. And, uh, you know, the, com the rest of the game proved that. Uh, Nakamura went rook queen a8, queen a8 now. Rook takes b6, and here, you know, he can take on a2. Well, if he takes immediately, then bishop takes f6, and the white certainly enjoys, um, you know, a very nice position with this knight on d4. Uh, black's castled being shattered and after all uh, the queen the black queen doesn't have targets uh, it's a powerful piece but without targets it's not such an efficient piece and white is a piece up is he has two pieces against the queen i mean they can coordinate they can create threats for instance against the bishop on e6 so here what could already be better and perhaps he should have taken on d4 and then on a2 but even then, uh, after, um, uh, you know, e6 is hanging, and I think perhaps he can even start with a move like bishop f3 or even e3. I mean, the problem on, on e6 remains. Uh, white can hope to be slightly better. After queen a4, in fact, white didn't give black the chance to take on a2 anymore. Rook d2, rook c8, and just h4. If you you know, if you switch on your computer in, in, in this position, your engine is going to show perhaps a slight advantage for black, uh, at least mm, by no means better for white. And uh, I think that's a, a mistake by the computer because uh, in practice, this position can only be better for white. So you went bishop d8, okay, then followed a sequence uh, of, you know, it's rapid chess, so you can't really... Um, condemn players for making inaccuracies. So I'm, I'm going to brow through the next moves quite quickly. Interesting, this move, bishop h3, when white keeps uh, his bishop mm, before playing knight d4. Because, uh, well, I've highlighted it, uh, the black squared bishop is not, I mean, the black bishop, the white squared bishop of, of, of black is not a great piece in this position. Um, queen e5, e3. Well, now, material wise, um, white has a rook, a knight, and a pawn for the queen. And it's a, it's a passed pawn, even though it's just on a2, not far advanced. 
it's a postpone after all and uh, for the long run it's uh, it's a trump h5 of course keeping pawns and of course not opening the h file if you open the h file then that's when the bishop on e4 could become a strong piece rook a6 rook b6 takes takes he has exchanged a rook that's a good operation for white and he takes on h6 well perhaps he should have played king g7 here well protecting that pawn but he he perhaps thought that he would be able to um, cause some problems with uh, queen e1 to follow threatening f2 threatening queen h1 but now white can play bishop g2 he's taken on h6 queen takes a2 takes takes king g2 all pawns are on the same side and in in this position i think technically white is simply winning he has a beautiful knight on d4 which can go to f5 sometimes there is a passed h pawn all pawns are on the same side of the board i repeat that that's very important when you fight against the queen which is the the most powerful piece on on well in chess and on the board it can go from one side to another in just one move so if you keep all your pawns on the same side then the queen is going to be less efficient and that's exactly the case here king g7 rook d6 g4 it's not an easy task for uh, black to defend this position rook f6 and and white coordinates his pieces beautifully now and he takes the pawn on g4 well the one on f7 first and then the one on g4 is gonna fall all right i'm gonna burrow through and here a small petite combinaison as capablanca would say a small combination winning winning actually but uh some things will happen i'm just gonna go through the next moves queen h5 rook h4 it seems as if white is completely winning check check queen e2 and here strangely enough it's not so easy there is only one move which wins for white and Aronian didn't see it and I'm sure most grandmasters more most top players wouldn't be able to find it especially in time trouble I mean it's almost study light here uh, well he played h h8 queen he queened his queen but then as we will see uh, this should have led to a perpetual check well the winning move is not easy to spot and uh, well it's highlighted here it's rook h4 to h6 and i mean it's not i don't really see how it's possible to find such a move with just a minute on the clock or even less um well you need to uh, to calculate of course some lines but the most difficult part of this move rook h6 is to see it to to take it take it into account at all so queen f5 queen h4 black runs out of chess uh of checks sorry queen f1 king h4 queen h1 check king g5 and no more checks and then you can just queen and uh well there is no perpetual check in this case actually well he went queen immediately check and check here on f5 and the king cannot escape now if you play queen g4 no that's not the right move queen f1 check and if you go down well there is easily perpetual check and if you make the mistake of going up then you lose the queen after queen h1 so he had to go down to g2 and then to g1 but here black could have delivered perpetual check but it's not easy because here in this position after queen after king d1 it's not easy to find the only move especially with a clock ticking the only move is queen d6 and then you can actually ensure draw on the diagonal here if king e1 queen g3 or if king e2 well that's if king e1 queen g3 the king cannot escape if you go up to uh, e2 there is queen d3 and you you actually secure the draw but sometimes in in these situations uh, the closer or the closest check is not obligatorily the best one you need to see a bit of geometry like the queen goes up and then you you may draw from this diagonal and this diagonal which is longer uh, so you you can actually disturb the king 
better if you are further sometimes, like, like the case here. But there is no systematic in, in what I say. I, I'm just relaying some cases that I've seen. And here he went to G1, that white, strangely enough, escapes checks. King E2, Queen G2, King E3, Queen F3, King D4. The king goes up, Queen C3, King F5. And after Queen E5, well, it's soon over with checks. And now he, in this position, he resigned after um, Queen H1, King G5. He has no more efficient chess. He has the Queen C1 check, but this allows Queen F4 counter check exchanging queens. So uh, Nakamura resigned. So let me just check the um, um, the chat. I have missed a bit of your comments. Okay, I'm happy to see that everything was fine. Nakamura has been playing the Queen's Gambit a lot. Yeah, he's played it a lot. He's become a much more solid player. Uh, he has mostly stopped his um, opening experiments, his very aggressive ex openings like the Dutch Leningrad or the, the King's Indian. Uh, he has become, with black at least, a much more solid player. And he is actually a very strong technical, technical player. His endgame technique is very good. Uh, his, um, his ability to convert advantages is extremely high, thanks to his calculating abilities as well. So uh, he's a very technical player, and that's why he's, he's strong in quiet openings as well, such as the Queen's Gambit declined, indeed. Um, yeah, he's, he's studied it deeply. He's been playing it for many years, but not as his main weapon. It's become his main weapon in the past two years or so. Um, yeah, right. Uh, well, just saying what you, you, you wrote, and that's, that's good. Yeah, Rook H6, very nice move, but it's very difficult as well. So we've, you've mentioned it, and it's true. Wesley so has dominated the rapid tournament in Leuven. He's won it with seven out of nine. Um, one and a half points ahead, his pursuers, I think, Aronian and Vasile Grav. And in that game against Giri, uh, I was saying, that, you know, this petite combinaison, which has been introduced in the chess uh, wagon by Capablanca. And I'm not going to play through the opening of this game, but there was a very cute combinaison combination by Wesley So here against Giri in round four after d5. Well, White is actually already clearly better here after f5. Look at the knight on d8. Not a nice uh, sight here. So he went f5. Well, rook b8 would um, not lose material uh, immediately, but after queen b3, white is just uh, has an uh, overwhelming advantage, actually. But he went f5, which seems to be normal because he frees the f7 square for the knight. And should the knight come to d6, or perhaps even to e5, and then d3 or f3, well, then, you know, at least black would be back in the game. <coughs> but after f5, Wesley so played this very cute combination. Knight takes a6. I like this move a lot. And the point is after pawn takes a6, d6. Well, if pawn takes d6, Queen takes e8, of course, and otherwise, if the queen moves somewhere, let's say to f6 or e5, there is the nice fork d7, winning a rook, so winning the exchange in the end. And in the and if he plays queen d7, there is pawn takes c7. The queen is attacked and the knight is hanging behind it, so white is going to be winning. So Giri just played knight f7. But d6 came anyway. Knight takes d6, knight takes c7. And uh, well, it looks like, you know, Wesley so was not recognizable last year in the first Grand Chess Tour, which actually took place in, uh, in Paris, the first leg. He finished last and was terrible. But there he seems to be hot and uh, doing great, uh, calculating efficiently. And here white is a pawn up and, uh, well, Wesley so converted quite comfortably afterwards. And finally, um, this game between Nakamura and Giri, not uh, for the game itself, but also uh, 
uh, also because of the opening, because it's it's been all rage in the past uh, years now, this bishop f4 on move two. You know, in my days, let's say, if I can say it like this, um, anyone who would play d4 on move one and not follow up with c4 on move two or three, let's say knight f3 and then c4, would be uh, labeled a um, boring player, how dare you play such boring openings? But nowadays this bishop f4 is not only popular, but it's also been proven that uh, white can reach a very lively, very interesting position. And now I, I'm just inviting you to follow the next moves. Knight f6, e3, bishop f5, c4. Well, he's played c4, but just on move four. e6, and knight f3 inviting and Giri accepted the invitation bishop takes b1 rook takes b1 bishop b4 check well this is nothing new and if you've been looking at um, some games with bishop f4 you've seen that before this bishop takes b1 followed by the check on b4 forces white to move the king because knight d2 loses to knight e4 loses a piece so King e2 here is the only move. He could actually have taken with queen b1 here, bishop b4 and gone to d1. That was actually the starting moves of the game uh, Magnus Carlsen against Wesley So from uh, this year's Viking Z in January. Uh, an absolutely great game uh, won by Carlsen in the end. Uh, when the opening was not too convincing, but uh, well, he did not stand worse, but afterwards he played fantastically with white. But here, okay, rook takes b1 and king e2. Um, that's not really the most boring chess I have seen <laughs> yet. So king e2, uh, d takes c4. Well, maybe he should just castle, but uh, you know, the, the point for, uh, for white is uh, that he's gonna slowly but surely complete his development. Uh, here, I believe queen b3 could be pretty annoying with opponent b7 hanging behind. So d takes c4 makes sense, queen a4 check, knight c6, knight e5, putting pressure, a5, knight takes c6 and queen d7. It seems as if black um, will win back uh, the pawn, uh, the piece, sorry, on c6, and actually he will, rook c1. And here I think he, you know, Giri must have miscalculated. This is round one actually, I've come back a bit in the tournament. Round one of the tournament and maybe Giri not completely uh, hot yet in that tournament he went knight d5 but even if he takes now on, on c6 how is, is he gonna do it well if he takes with the queen then white is certainly happy to trade queens and take on c4 he can do it immediately well i think he will do it immediately and with the queens off the board then of course the king on e2 doesn't feel uh, bad at all and if uh, white uh, if black takes with a pawn, rook takes c4, and um, well, how are you going to protect uh, the pawn here on uh, on c6? It's not so clear to me. So what appears to be doing really well here? Uh, well, Giri went knight d5, rook takes c4, and knight b6. Well, something must have gone wrong with his calculation here because it appears that black loses material after knight takes b4. White will remain two pieces for a rook with a um, well, clear advantage if, if not winning position. He took on b2, knight d3. Well, at least black has got a pawn, but technically this position is very bad for, uh, uh, for black. And with the two bishops especially, the king is safe on f2, the two bishops are very strong and uh, well Nakamura, I've just mentioned it in the previous game, his, uh, his technical level is extremely high, he's, um, he's extremely strong when it goes about converting an advantage and here he didn't fail to win this game afterwards. Here, you know, two bishops are much too strong. So uh, let me see. Um, yeah, I mean chess, Magnus played it many times, indeed. Uh, you're right, Ian, Ian Lamb. Um, C4 is the usual 
setup here, but against you know developing move bishop f5, it's not so bad to play c4 and try to uh, you know you can play c3 and it's true e6 knight d2 knight e f3 etc and then the position is very solid but black has nothing to worry about he's developed his bishop out of the pawn chain as well so he's quite happy about this um so by playing c4 you you're hoping to get some kind of queen's gambit or slav in case of c6 where you have already developed your own bishop on f4 which does not happen too often in the slav defense usually it remains behind the e pawn the, the e3 pawn a bit passively placed here you have already this on this bishop on f4 it's a small thing but it's something you can be happy about so i think that's the whole point of of the setup here and the reason why black doesn't really want to play a normal slav or a normal queen's gambit here which he could do as well if he goes bishop e7 i mean uh, that would be a, a queen's gambit with the um with a bishop on f5 probably something black can be happy about as well uh, so he could play c6 here i guess that would be very decent as well well it's strange that actually here white could also play knight c3 without being uh, you know disturbed too much i think that would be you know very logical as well in any case c3 would be very solid and c4 is a bit more challenging i think uh yeah thank you yeah thank you yeah we won the, the championship in france uh it was already um, almost two weeks ago well one and a half weeks ago so and i i played quite well uh, with six points out of eight but um in the end i missed a, f a chance in the last round i was not too happy uh you know the last round usually uh, leaves the strongest impression on the tournament and sometimes you forget what you've you've done before so my my last round draw was disappointing even though from the game i i don't think i deserve more <laughs> at all but um in the end the result i mean the overall result was was pretty good and uh, i was a bit anxious before the tournament because i hadn't been playing any th any tournament any longer tournament uh since uh 2017 and more precisely since the european team championship so i was a bit anxious uh as my form how my form would be but in the end it, it worked it worked pretty well so um, yeah i was happy and we we won the title as well with the, my team in bishvilla so that was good so um guys um thanks a lot it's we've been here for about an hour thanks a lot it's a pity that we couldn't talk um on messenger with any of you but i hope we're gonna uh, announce it um beforehand and uh, so you can prepare some questions as well we can talk chat uh with one one of you then yeah, for five ten minutes and then follow up with someone else if uh, people are interested don't hesitate that's uh, something i'd like to to add as well for my uh, live streams so we're not just chatting and reading the chat and answering like this but also talking you know life uh, that, that's a good idea so uh, thanks a lot um, thanks a lot for your attention for participating uh, as usual so actively in the chat that is really important um, don't hesitate also also to make some publicity if you like this live stream don't hesitate to talk about this to your friends so that they as well subscribe to this channel um, also I'm I do publish some videos um, not as many as I would like to but uh, I'm certainly gonna follow uh, in the coming days or weeks with a, a few videos as well so um, yeah thanks uh, again for your uh, attention and uh, see you in two weeks not next week but of course I hope you're gonna follow the um, uh, the live commentary on the Grand Chester in Paris if you speak French you can follow me uh, there is uh, commentary in English as well and I think perhaps even in Russian for those of you who may speak Russian uh, so uh, thanks a lot and see you in two weeks bye bye